Good morning. Glad to be with you this morning. I say that every time because I am glad to be with you. I'm glad that we can meet around God's Word. My hope is to encourage you and to be encouraged. That's where we find our encouragement in the Word of God. We grow. We see the mind of Christ, the character of Christ in us, the gospel which transforms us. It's always good news. We have been in the book of Revelation. We've taken a, a brief break, just speaking to Life to Life ministry. We're going to continue a break for this week and next week. Easter is next week. It's Palm Sunday now. And I just want to do a brief two-week series, and then we're going to step back into the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and we're going to move forward. I'm really looking forward to that. Can't wait. Today I want to look at this idea, this element of expectation. We've had a recent presidential election. President Obama was elected, then President Trump, and now President Biden recently elected. elected. It brings a lot of feelings, uh, a lot of emotions, Every election does. It, it, it raises a set of expectations on both sides of the political aisle and in the middle of the political aisle, whatever that might be. Expectations are a powerful thing. You have them, I have them. We have expectations as related to our health. We want good health. We want God to take care of us, keep us healthy. We have expectations in relation to people. We want our relationships to go well. We want God to bless us with, with good relationships, positive connections with people. We have expectations with our goals, our dreams, uh, whether it's athletics or our job or, or projects or whatever it might be. We set certain expectations and we want to meet those expectations. Uh, retirement, we have expectations. We strive to, to put in a plan that will give us security in retirement. We have expectations when it comes to the church. We have expectations when it comes to, to God himself, to Jesus Christ, to Christianity in general. We have expectations we place uh, in front of us. They drive us. They motivate us. Uh, they are significantly important to us. The expectations that I function from are, are important to me. What if my expectations are off? What if my expectations are more about me than they are about God? I want us to look at this whole idea of expectation this morning because, it, because it's significant to Palm Sunday. It's significant to that. This is Palm Sunday. It's a reminder to us of the work of Jesus Christ and, and the week uh, prior to Easter, Jesus Christ going to the cross and then rising from the dead. What what joy is that? Uh, it is Palm Sunday. I'm going to I'm going to be reflecting from John chapter 12. So let's look at that. John chapter 12, just a few verses, and then we're gonna we're gonna work from those verses in our thoughts this morning. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast, the Passover, that is heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. And so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Now it's later said in verse 16, and his disciples did not understand all these things. John gives us the briefest account, but it's purposeful. John reveals to us this, this account, this, this um, account of narrative of Jesus Christ going to the Passover feast, the week of the cross. Now the setting here, the context here is different than any other Passover that has ever they have ever experienced as a nation. The setting here this time, the context of this is not just the nation coming together, being reminded of God delivering them from Egypt, his provision. Uh, they're called to be faithful to him, to follow after him as a nation, to worship him, to, to yield themselves to him. But there's a context this year, this Palm Sunday, that's different than all others. That context is in one word, Lazarus. It's Jesus has just, in weeks prior, raised Lazarus from the dead. John chapter 12, verse 1. So he goes to Bethany the week before. He's there where Lazarus was raised from the dead. And that becomes the whole context. The, the religious leaders who have followed his ministry all these three years respond strongly to what is done here. John chapter 11, verse 57, remind us, Now the chief priests, the Pharisees, they gave orders. If anyone sees Jesus Christ, and Lazarus for that matter, they are to be arrested. They are actually seeking the death of Lazarus, and they want to arrest Jesus Christ. The people, on the other hand, chapter 11 of John, or chapter 12 of John, the crowd, the people, they learn that Jesus Christ is there. They come to see him, and they come to see Lazarus. They want to see Lazarus. They want to see this miracle, this recipient of this miracle. 
And many of the Jews here, it says, were going away and believing in, in Jesus. They were leaving Judaism, as it were. They were leaving, they were leaving the, the, the leadership of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, and they were going to Jesus Christ. The reason why this is true is because they had heard that Jesus Christ had done this miracle, had performed this sign, a sign reveals significance, a purpose of God himself. So that's the scene, that's the context, that's, that's the reality. The crowd is a buzz. When people would come to Jerusalem for the Passover, the numbers, we can't calculate the numbers. It's just so uncertain. But Jerusalem probably had maybe 30,000. It would, it, would, it would be 10 times that size or, or larger when Passover came. From all over Jerusalem and even beyond, people would come who believed in the God of Israel, where Jews would come and they would gather together on this time. And so the crowd was huge and significant. What we, what we find here is the reality of unmet expectations. Everybody who came to Passover this year came with expectations. Those expectations are going to go unmet. We're going to see the reality of that and how it just speaks into our own life. Consider the religious leaders here for, for a second. Just this them. They, they wanted to be in charge. That's what they wanted. Not to be second fiddle to anybody. They wanted to be honored, to be in control, to remain in control. They wanted to have things done their way. They, they believed the Messiah was coming. They didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah. They rejected that. But when the Messiah came, they wanted to be the ones who were at the top of the heap. They wanted to be the ones who remained in control, uh, who were the ones who, G, who Jesus would trust in and, and, and work through, and, and it didn't work out that way. They wanted, they wanted personal benefit. They wanted prestige. That was their expectation when the Messiah came, as they understood from the Old Testament. John chapter 12, we see the reality of what's happened. Verse 19, during this time of the Passover, during this last Passover, they observe this as they're talking to one another. The whole world has gone after Jesus. They've gone after him. That has turned their world upside down. They can't have it. And so their expectation here is to get rid of Jesus. Their goal here is to get rid of Jesus at the Passover. They've already determined that. He has a death sentence on him. They want to get rid of him. What about, what about other key figures during this week? Pilate, Herod, they have expectations as well. They're, this scene is thrust upon them. They have expectations in this scene. Pilate himself, one of the things he says, Jesus says, I'm the truth. Jesus says, what is truth? He wants to, he wants to know truth. He wants to understand to what is that. But, but he doesn't want the truth that Jesus gives because it implicates him. He doesn't want that truth. You know what? That speaks to us. Our expectations often are that. We want truth. We may want this, but we don't want it to speak into our lives. We don't want it to implicate us. That's expectation. That's where Pilate was. He wanted. To, he saw Jesus as a problem. He wanted to get rid of that problem. And so he tried to free him. He was accused of defying Caesar. And so what he wanted more than anything else was to be free of Jesus. And so he did all that he could to be free of this political problem, to be free of Jesus. Jesus was a... Uh, uh, brought terror on his soul and on his heart. He wanted to be free of Jesus. What a Herod. Well, when Herod had the opportunity to hear Jesus, he was thrilled. You know, he, he saw Jesus as a, a miracle worker, as, as a, uh, a, a sign giver. He saw Jesus as something maybe he could harness or someone, someone who would do something miraculous for him. He wanted to be, he wanted to be what? He wanted to be entertained. He wanted to have a, an experience. He wanted to see a miracle. He hoped for Jesus Christ to do something significant. It probably wasn't so much about justice here. It was about him seeing Jesus Christ do something that was significant for him. Okay? So they had different expectations. All these people who were a part of this scene and this narrative have different expectations. What about the people themselves? Well, the people we see here uh, clearly... We see passages that reflect the reality of what we read in John chapter 12, the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ. Back in Psalm 118, where many of these elements come out of, it is said, this prayer is, it's a messianic psalm, save us, we pray, O Lord. That's, that's where we get the phrase Hosanna. The word Hosanna means save us. It means uh, praise the Lord. It's, it's both sides of that coin. It is save us and we praise you for doing that. We praise you, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so, Lord, we pray that you would give us success. You would save us. Save us from what? Well, from Rome and from all these others. We see that. 
They wanted, they wanted to be delivered. They wanted to be delivered from Rome, from their problems, from their oppression, from their turmoil, from the difficulty of life as it was. They wanted a coronation. They remember King Jehu, when he became king, this is the scene that we see at the, at the triumphal entry here. I anoint you king over Israel. And so in haste, every man took his garment and put it under him. That's, that's what they did here when Jesus came into Jerusalem. They put palm branches underneath him. They laid their garments underneath him. It was a sign, a recognition that he was, he was king. And so that's what they wanted. they wanted. They wanted to be delivered. They wanted a king. They wanted to see more miracles. They wanted to see Jesus Christ work. They wanted to see these things happen right here. So what they wanted was a kingdom. They wanted it now. They wanted to be freed from Rome now. That's what they wanted. So I tell you what, folks, expectations are high here during this week. You know, when we, when we approach uh, a situation, a relationship, an encounter, something in our life, circumstances, with high expectations, one of the things we need to do is look at those expectations and, and, and reflect and ask ourselves, are the expectations I have here, are they God's expectations for me in, in this? Or are they expectations of my own doing? Because determining whatever one it is will determine how I respond in that circumstance. So that's what the people want. What about the disciples? We have these 12 disciples and many of the disciples who followed him. Uh, the larger the group of disciples as well. They want an opportunity to serve Jesus Christ. We're going to see that in just a second. Uh, it's going to come up in just a moment. But here also was true. The disciples themselves, they were, they were arguing, they were positioning, they were angling for a position of greatness. If the kingdom is just about to be here, already at the Last Supper here that um, this week, they're arguing even then about who's going to be the greatest, who's going to have the highest privilege. So this is on their heart and on their mind. Uh, they wanted they wanted a kingdom. They want the kingdom of, of Jesus Christ. They want to see Jesus reign, but they want it with the rights, with the privileges of apostleship. You see, they still have that element of the flesh in their expectations. They still have that element of, of self in those expectations. And I tell you what, that's a challenge for all of us. The, the reasons that we often get so disappointed, disillusioned and with expectations in our life because they're driven from our own our own self they're driven from our own wants our own desires we see that here reflected as well what about judas well judas wanted a kingdom just like they did but he didn't want a savior they wanted a savior they loved the savior they they wanted to be like him but in their flesh they battled and so those expectations often came from their own heart and not from the lord's in their heart god's going to minister to them and change that but that's kind of the reality so here's what's taking place here here's here's what's going on here's what they couldn't understand all the people here's the things that that they couldn't see they couldn't understand they couldn't grasp when our expectations are driven by our own heart not god's they're driven because we see things we don't understand about god we don't understand about situations in our life we don't understand and expectations are a deadly trap or they are a great catalyst in our life that can be either one here, here uh, all the main uh, actors and actresses, all the main people in this text were driven by expectations that would be troublesome for them uh, in the week to come here, this week of Passover. What they couldn't understand was that Jesus had a timetable that wasn't theirs. Matthew says, he, as he's t speaking to the disciples, I truly, I say to you in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, I'll tell you what, doesn't that sound fabulous that's what they heard with their ears you will you who have followed me will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel they heard that and they thought you know what it is right here we are on the we're on the precipice of god bringing his kingdom you know we're praying for the kingdom of god to come we're praying for the lord to return you can taste it sometimes you can see the changes in, in culture and you can just taste the nearness of the lord's return how much more for these Apostles, these disciples, the followers of Jesus Christ, who heard these twelve, who heard these words, thinking that Jesus Christ is about about to bring His kingdom in. But they were driven by this, but it, but their their flesh drove it in such a way that it brought them to the place of of arguing over who would be the greatest. That's what happened. The timetable. They didn't know that it wasn't about to take place. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't grasp that. They couldn't see. They couldn't understand the humility of Jesus. The crowds. The disciples couldn't see, understand that. 
what, what is done in John 12 here at the, at the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ is reflected here in Zechariah. As he comes in on this, on this donkey, it's reflected of the humility of Jesus Christ. Behold, your king is coming to you. That's expectation. This, in John, is, is fulfillment of Zechariah 9. 9. They see that some may have made that connection. Okay? And he's coming to you righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey. Pilate or Herod or a general's coming into the city would, would come in on a, on a white steed, a stallion, majestic, uh, a conquering hero, a war hero. Jesus Christ one day will come back on that white stallion, that white steed, the second coming. But he comes now on, on this donkey, which is a symbol of peace. It's a symbol of humi humility. And they would not be able to understand the significance of what is being portrayed here from Zechariah and lived out now as Jesus comes. They couldn't understand what they saw as Jesus comes towards Jerusalem, his brokenness. In Luke chapter 19, as Jesus is, has endured the worship and praise of his people here, Hosanna, Hosanna. Then he, as he draws near, he sees the city. And in this scene here, what does he do? He, he weeps over Jerusalem. Why does he weep over it? Because he knows they're going to reject him. Why does he weep over it? Because of the sin of the city, because of the bondage of sin. And he... He sees this entry not as not as a political triumph. It ultimately will be a triumph, but not the ones not the one in which they envision. They don't understand the sacrifice of Jesus. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. This is his greatest act of service. He's washed their feet. He has served them for three years. He has been a servant, but now he will sacrificially give his life. You know, when we don't understand what Jesus is doing, what he's fulfilling, what he's accomplishing, our expectations can go awry. That's what happens here. They don't understand. They don't understand that God is glorified in the death of Jesus Christ. Among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. They wanted to talk to Jesus. They, the disciples come to him and says, the Greeks want to talk to you. Jesus answers them. This is what he says. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. God is being honored Jesus is being glorified at the cross, in the cross, through the cross. This is the reality. The Greeks have a, their, their mention here is a significant element in the answer that he gives. It's time for me to be glorified. He is, this is the hour that has come. Jesus has come to be glorified, to, to be lifted up, to be raised up, to, be, to, to take his place in our place, to become sin for us to become the payment for sin, to become the cleansing for sin, the washing for sin, the forgiveness for sin. He becomes all of that. He is glorified. He honors God. But it's significant here that the Greeks are mentioned in this text, in this, in this beautiful text of Passover, because it reveals the purpose of the Messiah. You see, the, when the Israel thought of Messiah, they think of Israel. They think of Messiah that's for Israel. For Israel, it is a, it is the fulfillment of all that is written in God's word for Israel. But it's broader than that. The Son of Man, Luke nineteen says, came to seek to save the lost. He doesn't come just for Israel. He doesn't come just to be king of Israel over Rome. He's not here to deliver them from Rome. He's here to deliver sinners from sin. The amazing thing is the Greeks were just mentioned before. He has come to deliver all of mankind from sin if by faith we will just come to him and receive him as Savior. He comes to be the Savior of the Romans who they want deliverance from. If they knew that, they would have rejected it at the time. That's what happens here. He came, he came because he loved not only the Jews and Israel, these here who his heart was broken over, but he loved the very people who were the enemies of Israel. He loved the Gentiles, the Greeks, the Romans. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And that's what he came to do. They couldn't understand, they couldn't see the reality of spiritual warfare. The cross is spiritual warfare. He gives us a call. We see here in Acts chapter 26, he gave Paul a, a, a mission, which is our mission as well. He has sent you and I here, right, so that we may declare the gospel, so that people would turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. It's spiritual warfare. What he would do at the cross, no one else could successfully do. Spiritual warfare. He had to overcome Satan, sin, and death. 
It is spiritual. So when they are uh, honoring him and singing his praises and, and, and waving and laying down palm branches and their and their clothes their cloaks before him and, and he's in their and they're just doing all of that, they have they have in mind all of these expectations, but those expectations aren't these that we just saw. They can't understand, they can't see. You know, when we have when we have these strong expectations in our heart, but they're not driven by relationship with Christ. They're not driven by desire to know God's heart first. We're gonna we're going to have a reaction. You will have a reaction in your life because this is true. So what is the reaction that we see here? What is the reaction? There is a strong reaction here because the expectations are not met, because the expectations are broken. I want us to I want to reveal that. Look at the religious leaders here. They rejected Christ. They hated him. They pursued him. They stalked him. They captured him. For three years, this is what they were engaged in. They hated who he was. Their expectations were never met in Christ. That's not what they wanted. The high priests sentenced him to death. Annas and Caiaphas, they sentenced him to death because he wasn't what they wanted in Messiah. They could not accept the Messiah that they saw in Jesus Christ. He didn't meet their expectations. When the world sees Jesus Christ, it responds violently against the truth because that's not what the world wants in in religion. It's not what the world wants in Christ. The world waters down who Jesus Christ is. The world makes makes Jesus Christ, um, uh, it, it, it mutes Jesus Christ. It neuters Jesus Christ. It takes away his power, his deity, because the world hates the Jesus Christ that's revealed in the scriptures. The same thing is true here. They mocked him, they tortured him, they executed him. That's that's the reality. That's what the religious leaders did. That was their response. Violent, strong, extreme against Jesus Christ because he was the truth. And the truth exposed their sin and their lives. The people, they were followers, they were worshipers. They turned from that and they said what? They said crucify him. That's what they did. Their response was strong, it was violent, because their expectation of Jesus bringing deliverance from Rome wasn't met. He gave up his life. He wouldn't do what, he, what they thought he came to do. And they turned against him. Many who were believers, who came to him and believed, were revealed not to be genuine believers in Jesus Christ. Why? Because their expectations were not met. They had a different expectation. What are the expectations of your heart towards God and toward how he functions in your life and mine. That's really a revealing and important question that we have. <clears throat> what about Pilate, Herod? Well, we have Pilate here. He found Jesus innocent. He wanted truth, but he rejected it. But he wanted political peace more. That's what he wanted. So what did he do? He turned Jesus Christ over to be cruci- cru- crucified. He was terrorized in his heart. He was despondent in his heart. Because Jesus, who he was, who he claimed to be, it pricked his heart. But the political, the political pressure was stronger than the work of his response to the work of the Spirit of God. And he rejected Jesus Christ. He turned him over to be crucified. Herod, who was Herod, who was thrilled to Jesus, see Jesus. You know what? When when we look at when we look at Jesus. And he's only, and we only look at him as is he expedient for me? Is he something I can fit into my worldview? Is he something I can fit into my life and make it work? That's where Pilate was. He couldn't do that. The truth always was speaking against him. Herod, on the other hand, saw Jesus as someone to entertain him, to give him a, a, a religious experience, a spiritual high, uh, uh, access to power that's that's his, that's mine. That's what it's all about. That's where Herod was. And when he didn't get what he wanted, he, he turned in contempt to Jesus Christ and he released him back to Pilate. We know the result. So is the result here is, is that the people, their leaders, rejected Jesus Christ. The stone that the builders rejected, Psalm 118, that Messianic Psalm, has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Amazing here, isn't it? That he was rejected is, is written in Scripture as being a marvelous thing because, because of what it accomplished for us, because it was a part of the sovereign purpose of God for us. What about the disciples? Well, we know Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus Christ. Judas hung himself 
because his expectations weren't met. He wanted a deliverer. He wanted a political deliverer. He wanted to be high on the totem pole. He wanted to have that, that prestige as well. He didn't have that. He didn't get that. He wanted to force the hand of Jesus Christ so that he would take that mantle. When he didn't, G Judas rejected Jesus Christ and found himself in a position of utter hopelessness and bitterness because he had rejected the Savior. Peter attacked the enemy with a sword. He responded. He betrayed Jesus Christ. He did it three times. Expectations, folks. That's what it's all about here. Um, you know, we can, we, can, we can identify with the disciples. We can feel their hurt. We can feel their desperation. We can feel all these things. But we, we do the same thing. We respond. We react out against people, against Christ sometimes, against the church, against people that we love because our expectations aren't met. We find ourselves not knowing what to do. We find ourselves desperate. That's what happens. We find ourselves weak and vulnerable, and we even we even deny the power of Christ, and we and we for a moment in time we step away from the very thing that we treasure more than anything else. That's what Peter did, because his expectations were shattered. The disciples scattered. That's what they did. Even after the resurrection, when it was told to them, He is risen, they couldn't believe. They were in fear and discouragement and disillusionment, and that's what took place. That was the reality. They, they had a loss of hope. When Jesus met the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, and we don't know exactly who they were, they talked about His being crucified, and they said this, we, we had hoped that He was the one to redeem Israel. Do you, do you understand how powerful that statement is? We are walking here, as they're walking and sharing with this stranger, they don't know who he is. You can you can feel the the loss of hope. You can feel the desperation. You can feel the sadness. You can feel the grief. Grief. We had hoped that this would be the the pinnacle for Israel. We had hoped that that the Messiah was here. We had hoped that that we would have a king over Israel. We had hoped that we could be freed from Rome. We had hoped that he was the one that the Old Testament had promised, and those things were dashed. Of course, Jesus would <laughs> change everything in that conversation for them. Think of the psalmist. The psalmist just reflects some of these things that we feel in our heart when we're going through these. We find ourselves asking these questions. God, where are you? Where are you? When our expectations aren't met, they're not fulfilled. We say, God, we just express, I'm weary, I'm tired, I'm wore out, I don't have it anymore, I don't have the strength, I can't get up, I can't go to church, I can't read my Bible, so wore out. God, where are you? I'm tired. God, when will you? God, when will you do? What? God, when? I have been pr God, when? When will you comfort me, God? When will you answer prayer? God, when will you do this? And we grow disillusioned. We grow dis discouraged. We wander away from walking with God. We wander away from our faith. That's what we do. Say, God, when are you going to fulfill your promises? I long. God, you promised to do this. How come you haven't done it? We place our natural expectations on him, not God-given expectations, natural expectations. Sometimes they're driven by God-given expectations, but they're driven by the reality of that we want it now. We don't wait for His timetable, His perfect timetable. Many of the expectations that we place on God are maybe good and right, but the expectation is, is corrupted because we want God to do it now. We want Him to do it yesterday. We don't take into account what God is doing. God, answer me. Answer me now. Answer me quickly. God, would you answer me? I have, I've come to you in prayer over and over and over again. The people of Israel here, God, we have prayed for a deliverer. This is it. And then that prayer went unanswered in their eyes. I've looked vainly for help. I've looked everywhere for help. I'm going everywhere. I'm trying to find a solution to what's going on in my life. God, I'm looking everywhere. God, would you help me? And when God doesn't do it on our timetable or the way that we want it, when our expectations are not His expectations for us, we get disillusioned and our responses can become very strong against Jesus Christ, against people we love, against God Himself, against the church, against faithfulness. Is that where you're at this morning? We often need to look at our expectations. We need to refine and retune our expectations. We need to, we need to refine what we are looking for. We need, to, we need to replenish and renew our relationship with Christ. See, Jesus meets, Jesus exceeds our expectations. I want you to know that's true. It's not something that we just lay out there because we're preaching and we've got we to gotta communicate something good. This is, this is the truth of God's Word. He meets our expectations. He exceeds them. That's what He does. But let's see how He does that. He shatters our expectations. He breaks them down. Uh, he reveals our expectations. Often they're driven by 
ourself. They're driven by our natural opinion, our, our flesh, and not by what He wants. But He, but He meets our expectations when we yield those expectations to Him and let Him define those expectations, shape those expectations, conform those expectations so that they are they are appropriate to what the Word of God says. Psalm forty. He drew me up. He set my feet on a rock. He put a new song in my mouth. Many will see and fear and trust the Lord. There's no time stamp on there. We often pray these very things. God, I got I'm caught right here. I'm in destruction. Think there's just destructive things going on in my life, around my life, and the people in my life that I care about. God, it's just destruction. I'm in a bog. I can't get out. I can't change the circumstances. I can't seem to change things in my life. God, would you answer? And when He doesn't do that on our timetable or our way, then we then we react sometimes violently against Him. We sometimes we react strongly against Him. We lose faithfulness. We we step away from what He's called us to do. We grow discouraged. We grow disillusioned. But the psalmist the psalmist reminds us this is what God does. He does pick us up out of that miry clay. He does put our feet on the rock. That's the word of God on that foundation we have in Christ. He does put a, a, a new song in our heart, in our life. That's what He does. He, he does allow His work in our life then to be noticed and impactful on the people who are observing our life. That's what He does. He does it in ways we don't always comprehend, in a timetable we don't always comprehend. John chapter 16, we see this reality. Jesus says to the disciples, you have sorrow now. You know what? So do you and I. We can relate to this. We have sorrows right now that we're walking through. Sorrows of our life, sorrows of people we care for. We carry those burdens, those sorrows, our own or others. We know sorrow. He says, you know what? You have sorrow. You will have sorrow. But I, but I will see you again. And your hearts will rejoice. And no one will take your joy from you. No time stamp on here other than what we know. That is when, when he rises from the dead. But they don't know that time stamp. They can't, they can't catch, capture. They know it intellectually. He's told them he's going to rise again in three days, right? But, but in their heart, they just can't. They just can't grasp that until it happens. There are things about God's Word and about God that we can't just fully understand, even though we know it's true. And so that's where faith comes into play. And we simply believe God even when we don't understand. Our expectations are often shattered because, because we simply have chosen not to trust God when we don't have all the answers. We don't see God doing it the way that we hoped He would or the way we think He should. Revelation 21. Well, we hear this all the time at funerals. What a verse of encouragement. But you know what? This ultimately doesn't take place till the very end of time when that, when that millennial kingdom is being wrapped up and we step into eternity. And then these words come into fruition and are fulfilled. Romans 21, he will, no time stamp, but it's going to happen then, right? He will wipe away every tear. You know what? You know tears. You've had tears. You know what that's all about. Death, you and I have lost people that we love so dearly. The mourning, the grief that goes with that, the grief that can, that can, just, that can be so oppressive in our life for periods of time because of the loss of a loved one. Crying, just, just the crying, if not the tears of crying, the crying, the inner crying of the soul, crying over loss, crying over missed opportunity, crying over, over sin in, in our life or the lives of people that we love, crying over circumstances, pain. We all know pain. There's so many different kinds of pain that we experience. It's a reality. God says, I will wipe away all those things. You know what? We place this expectation on God and we say, I want it done now. Take this situation from me. Take me out of the situation. Take me out of this. And when God doesn't do it, if I lack my, if I lack faith in the Lord, it will be revealed in how I respond against God, against His Word, when He doesn't do it my way. So how do we move forward? How do we do that? Just some simple, final re reminders to us. Psalm 37.4 we thrive when we focus on important things here. Delight yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. You know, those, those two parts are important in the order in which they are written. We must first delight ourselves in Jesus Christ, in the Lord. We must delight ourselves in Him. Um, to be focused on His character. 
to be focused on his faithfulness, to be focused on his word, to be focused on his purposes in our life. When we delight ourselves in him, we make an intentional decision to trust God, to say, God, it's worth it to follow after you. We make an intentional decision to love him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength and all of our mind, no matter what's going on in my life. We make an intentional decision to love him and to love others. Even though our expectations aren't being met, we allow Jesus Christ to refine those expectations according to his character, according to his word, according to his faithfulness, according to his promises. That reshapes our expectations. The best thing you and I can do is come to the Lord and say, God, refine my expectations so that they reflect the word of God and who you are. And when, and when that's taking place, then he will give me the desires of my heart. Why? Because the desires of my heart then will be his desires. The second part happens because the first part is essentially taking place. I, my desires are becoming his desires. My expectations are becoming his expectations for my life. Is that true of you this morning? Psalm 71, verse 5. For you, O Lord, you are my hope. You are my trust, O oh Lord, from my youth. I would encourage you right now, start. Start right now. Pursue the Lord. Pursue understanding the character of the Lord. Pursue knowing the Lord and loving the Lord. Pursue His Word. Pursue knowing His promises in your life. Pursue those things. Go after it. Love Him with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. Make make your relationship authentic and genuine. Start now. Don't wait. When you start now, you build a foundation, a foundation of faithful, faithfulness, a foundation of trusting God. That foundation becomes the rock when our, when our expectations aren't met on our timetable or our way. That foundation of faith reminds us, oh, maybe God's doing something I don't understand. Maybe God's doing something good in my life. That maybe though I can't see it, I'm going to trust him. Because I know God is always good. He allows, he allows very difficult things, fiery trials, Peter says, to come into our life on a regular basis. On a regular basis. Because we're a child of God. It is witness, it is testimony, it is refining, it is glory to God. He allows those things to take place. If my expectation doesn't conform to to being refined by Jesus Christ, I will, I will respond accordingly in my life. I will never draw close to Jesus Christ, to his church, to the community of believers, to, to faithfulness in his word and listening to the spirit of God and talking to him in prayer. I'll never draw close to those things, to him ultimately in relationship if my expectations are different than that. Numbers 23, God is not a man that he should lie. God's not a man. Aren't you glad that God's not a man? He's not a man that he should lie or a son of man, that he should change his mind. He has said, and will he not do it? And he has spoken, and will he not fulfill it? See, he said, and he will do it. He has spoken, he will fulfill it. Just, I have to trust him. I have to remind myself, Brad, trust him. Trust God, he knows what he's doing. Brad, trust him. You need to remind yourselves, on the authority of God's word, you can trust him. Is there difficulty in your life because expectations went awry? Set those expectations aside and say, God, what would you have me to see here? God, what would, you, what would you have to take place here? God, what do you want to do? What do you want in me? What do you want from me? God, what do you want to do in my life? What is your will for me? That's where, that's where we set the expectations that we need to have for our life. And then, and then lastly, Romans 15. May the God of hope, see here's the, beautiful, here's the beauty of it, fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. It's so key here. God will do this when in faith we come to Him. He will give to us joy and peace. Those are the cornerstones of expectations that conform me to Christ. Those are the result of a believer, a child of God, walking with Christ. How key that is. Next week is Easter. We're going to talk about the resurrection. We're going to, that's going to be the springboard. But what we're going to talk about is this, our living hope in Jesus Christ. The joy and the peace that we can have that is the fruit of the resurrection. 
I want to invite you to come back because next week is the answer to this week. Next week is the second part to this week. Next week is the, is the revealer to us of how our expectations can be met in Christ, how they can, they can be conformed by faith to accomplish the will of God in our life. Beautiful things. I want to invite you back. Beautiful, beautiful opportunity to grow, to be like Christ. Thank you for joining with us today. Come back again next week. Join us if you can. We're going to have a great Easter service. If you're able to come and, and you thought, you know what? I've thought about coming back out. This is the time to come. I want to invite you to come to join us 930 next week. Let's meet together. If not, we'll meet with you here together. We'll open God's word. Thank you for joining with us. May God bless you, speak to you, encourage you, feed your soul. Amen, amen, and amen.